very warm welcome to our morning worship service here at Oxford Evangelical Presbyterian Church. A very warm welcome to you, a warm welcome to our church family uh, joining on Zoom. Uh, we're also live streaming to YouTube on a separate machine as well. So a very warm welcome to everyone, uh, to members and friends and uh, those who call Oxford Evangelical Presbyterian Church their spiritual home. Really, really good to have you with us uh, this morning. And a very warm welcome to anyone else uh, who is coming in on YouTube. I know a number of people do come in or watch the video later. So I wanted to make sure you get a very warm welcome as well. Uh, I know if you're coming in on YouTube, you may be thinking, well, how do I follow along on the service? How do I sing and uh, track through what's happening? Well, you can go to our website, uh, oxfordprez.co.uk. And if you scroll down the homepage, just beneath the embedded YouTube video are links to the PDFs. Just click on them and it'll open up a new window for you on your computer or your laptop or iPad or whatever you're using. And there will be a copy of the order of service for you so you can follow along and sing along and join in all the elements of the service. If you're coming in on Zoom, it should, all of that should be brought up on the screen for you at appropriate times. So a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, just one or two notices uh, for uh, this morning. We do have our in-person service this evening. Now sadly we had planned on bringing it sl slightly earlier, moving it from 5 to 4.30 so that we could have a picnic afterwards, but the weather is just not good enough. So uh, it's been, I've been tracking the weather forecast the, the last 24, 48 hours and it's just been all over the place. But what, one thing that is guaranteed is that it's going to be overcast uh, and not particularly pleasant so we're going to move our evening service back to five o'clock so we're meeting at five this evening and uh, uh, we we won't be following it with a picnic of course if you want to bring some some sandwiches along and, and have them afterwards that, that of course you'd be more than welcome to do that uh, but uh, we'll hopefully rearrange that for a few weeks time so that we can enjoy a picnic together uh, but that does mean uh, please do book. Uh, the likely it is, because of the weather, we'll be indoors at the meeting house this evening. So if you haven't booked in advance, please do book, because that means uh, we will have to put a seating plan together. Uh, and for those of you who don't have an exemption, then we'll be asking people to wear masks indoors and uh, we'll, we'll be uh, maintaining social distancing according to the government rules and guidelines. So please do uh, book in advance. It's really important so that I can get the seating plan together. Booking closes at 2.30 this afternoon and then I'll get the seating plan out at about 3 o'clock. So um, if you're hoping to come tonight, please do book in advance and uh, we can get that sorted. That would be really, really helpful. So 5 o'clock tonight, not 4.30. Hopefully we will have the picnic sometime soon and uh, looking for opportunities throughout this summer for us as a church. We're going to get together and fellowship together. What we've missed over these last, what, 16, 17 months? I've, I've stopped bothering to try and count. It's been too long, hasn't it? Um, but hopefully over the summer months, we'll be able to have some time together as much as we can, either just as families or as a church as well, as best we can. Well, we've come to worship God to mark this first day of the week when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And one thing we do, uh, perhaps one of the most important things we do in worship and why we worship is to acknowledge the rule and the reign of our God, of our triune God. And Psalm 99 reminds us of the awesome, majestic place of authority that our God holds. Listen to these words from Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. We come before a great and an awesome God who's worthy of all our praise. Who's worthy for us to come and tremble like the earth does before him. So let's bow in prayer. Humble ourselves and give him all the glory. Let's pray together. Lord, our great God, how easily we call upon your name. How quickly 
your name slips off our tongue. And Lord, we pray that as we draw near you today, that you remind us of your awesome greatness, of your majesty, that you are enthroned in the heavens, that the earth trembles before you, that the seraphim and the cherubim give you praise because you sit enthroned upon the cherubim. You are worthy of our praise. We come to bow before you, triune Father, Son and Holy Spirit. You are wholly other than we are. You are from eternity and we are from the dust. Nothing can be compared to you for you rule and reign over all things. Lord, remind us of this truth as we gather online this morning, whether by Zoom or YouTube, as we gather in our homes and with our families. Remind us, Lord, of your greatness, of your majesty. Fill us again with a sense of the awe that we should have at the very thought of you. And yet also, Lord, even as we adore you, please draw near to us. Please come by the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your love, with your peace and with your goodness. Remind us of your gospel, that though awesome and great and majestic, the God who reigns, you have stepped onto the pages of human history. You have stepped into the dust of this world's geography. You have walked among this world's people in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have come among us to save us and to draw us close to yourself. Lord, in awe and wonder, we worship you. But fill us with fear and awe and wonder at the God who loves us and has given us so much. We ask it. Together with your blessing upon us, wherever we are, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we should delight in the praise of our God. And uh, we're going to do that now, using these words from Psalm 84. Psalm 84. O Lord of hosts, how lovely is your dwelling place. This, this is a Psalm of David, written when he couldn't meet with God's people. When he was remembering what it was like to be with God's people in worship. And so what an appropriate psalm for us to sing in our homes, longing to be with one another, longing to be able to worship God in person as well as online. Let's sing this to God's praise, yearning for God's presence and blessing. O Lord of hosts, how lovely is your dwelling place. Jacob, 
Well, even as that psalm grieves not being able to be with God's people to worship and longs for those courts of God's dwelling, there's another thing we should grieve <coughs> over, and that's our sin. Because we come before a holy God, and our sin is an offence to him. It's the reason why Jesus Christ became man, and why he lived in obscurity for 30 years, and why he taught and and came to reverse the effects of the fall of sin in his miracles. Why he went to the cross and died. Not, not simply another man of really tens of thousands of people who were crucified 2,000 years ago. But as the God-man, the saviour of his people, bearing our sin upon his shoulders. And so our, our sin should, should grieve us. And that's why it's good and right that we confess our sin to our God. We're going to do that now using these words that will come up on your screens if you're coming in on Zoom. These are simple words, short words, and yet we should make them our own and, and humble ourselves and grieve over our sin and take joy in our Saviour as we say them together. Let's confess our sin together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your way. And walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. For the sake of your Son, have mercy on us and forgive us. God loves to hear his people say those words. Because before we ask for forgiveness, he promises to forgive. Listen to these words from Isaiah chapter 1. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Our God wills us, offers us forgiveness before we even ask for forgiveness and it's there for us in that wonderful work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take comfort in these simple 101, Christianity 101, basic and yet profound truths that are ours in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, our, our hearts do grieve at every thought of our rebellion, of our sin, of our selfishness, our shaking our fist at you, but perhaps not physically, but functionally in our lives as we seek to dethrone you, as we seek to enthrone ourselves. And Lord, we do that in a whole number of ways. We, we do it by living as if you did not exist. We do it by refusing to listen to your word and to your laws. We do it by 
quietening our conscience that cries out to us day by day that who we are and what we do is wrong so often that our selfishness and our pride our lack of love for others is an offense to you lord forgive us for our rebellion forgive us O oh lord perhaps more than anything that we do not feel the weight and the burden of our sin as we should we need to repent of our repentances we need the tears of our confession of sin to be washed clean and we thank you O oh lord that there is hope and there is forgiveness and there is salvation not because we repent not in the sincerity of our repentance not in some feeling of penitence that we can conjure up in ourselves not because we can try and batter ourselves down and make ourselves feel worse than we feel hope is not found in those things they're found in Jesus Christ they're found in his finished and accomplished work they're found in your great display to this world to every sinner of your offer of forgiveness in Jesus Christ so Lord lift up our eyes as much as we grieve over our sin we would rejoice doubly triply in the provision for sinners that you have made in Jesus Christ we thank you and we praise you and we ask that you would fill us anew today with hope with thanksgiving, with a deep sense of delight, of wonder, of awe and of love to you, our God. Because in Jesus Christ, our sin has been exchanged for his perfect righteousness. In Jesus Christ, our hell has been exchanged for his heaven. In Jesus Christ, the just judgment upon sinners has been exchanged for the wonderful acceptance to the forgiven sinners in Christ. Lord, give us joy, give us hope. Lord, forgive us that we, we delight in, in the trinkets of this world. We, we delight in experiences and we, we delight in, in money and material things and we, we delight in, in, in things that are, that, that are good, that are gifts that you've given to us. And we make so much of these, these small passing pleasures and we make, we make so little of Christ of the forgiveness that is ours in him. Lord, recalibrate us today. Give us a new sense of, of biblical orientation, set in Christ and the cross and his resurrection and his person and work at the centre of our very beings, of our lives, of our church life, that, that in him and from him and through him and to him all things come and everything else in this world then gains a new and a fresh perspective. Lord, help us, we pray, and accept our thanks. We do pray for our world. We look at the consequences of sin in our world. We look at the injustices of our world. We think of countries where widows and orphans are being oppressed. We, we think of countries where the poor are being trodden down so that the rich can be lifted up. We think of countries where millions of refugees are being displaced because of war, because of terror, because of brutal regimes. We think of countries, O oh Lord God, specifically where the Christian church is being harassed, sidelined. Lord, we think of organisations around our world that are fraught with corruption, that in the name of peace are perpetrating violence, are ignoring the plight of your people around this world. Lord, we cry out to you for justice. We cry out to you for mercy. We cry out to you, O oh Lord, that, that governments and organisations and those in places of power would be advocates for the weak, for the poor, for the orphan, for the widow, for the displaced, for the refugee, for those whose lives are being terrorised by, by criminals and by powers over them. Lord our God, we cry out for justice and that cry has its end point in a cry for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ because we know that it is only when he returns, when the great judge of all calls the great court of this world together and, and accounts, calls all men and women to account that only then will true justice be done. 
And we long for that justice. Our world longs for this justice. Lord, give justice to your oppressed people, the church, wherever they are hurt, lonely, struggling, harassed, isolated. We think of countries like Nigeria, northern Nigeria particularly, of North Korea, of China. We think of the Sudan, Libya, Eritrea. Father in heaven, we long for your people to know peace. We long for your people, as we just sang, to know the joy. Even the sparrows find a nesting place in your presence. We long that your oppressed people would know that nesting place, that home, that delight of being in your courts safely, without fear of persecution, giving you praise. Hear us, Lord. We cry out for our lost world. And we do cry out for our church as well, the needs of our church. Lord, we do thank you for the provision of work. For many of us over these last few months, we've been crying out for a number of our of those who are dear to us in our church community. And you provided work for many and we give you thanks and we pray on that in their new roles and their new jobs and their new careers and callings, that you would bless them, help them settle uh, prosper the work of their hands and also help them to be lights in a dark place. Lord, we also lift up to you our brother Alberto who has important exams online tomorrow and Tuesday and we pray that you would bless him in those exams and that he would he would know f a freshness of mind and, and that all he has learnt this year and indeed over his whole life he'll be able to bring to bear that he would be able to acquit himself well and that he would pass these exams to your honour and to your glory. Be with him and the family as they visit family in Germany. Bless them and be with Alberto particularly over these next couple of days. Father, have your hand for good on our brother Roy as the effects of recent surgery rumble on and we ask that his diet and um, and all that is going on in his life would be able to settle down and he would know peace of mind and body. Lord, be with him and, 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 the, and the wider family as well. Lord, we do pray for our children. Lord, we, we cry out to you that they may grow up knowing you, loving you and serving you. Give them a delight in you. Lord, even, even over this last year or so, we've not been able to meet for many months at all in person. And so, some of our children have been born into online church. And Lord, we, we pray for those that, that have known what it's like to meet in person and miss that. And we pray that they may look back at these times of sitting in lounges and around dining tables and with family. And it's hard to engage looking at a computer screen. And Lord, please, we pray that despite these things you would minister your grace and your goodness and Christ himself to our children that they would grow up to know you and love you that they would put their faith in you Lord hear us bless our church please add to us we long that the lost those who do not know you would come to know you and we pray for you to be at work among us hear our prayers receive our thanksgiving forgive our every sin in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. Well, children, I wonder if you know what this is. Does anybody know what that is? Anyone know? Let me hold that as high up to the screen as possible. Anyone know what that is? Any ideas? Come on, you can have a few guesses. It's not a dinosaur, just in case you were thinking. Any ideas? Go on, Robin. Well done. I thought, that's excellent, Robin. I thought someone might start with a butterfly because it, if it was me, I'd be sitting there going, it's a butterfly. But you, you, you obviously know a lot more about the distinguishing marks of butterflies and moths. Well done. It's a moth. Look at that. What a beautiful moth. Does anyone know what kind of moth it is? We do actually have these moths in Great Britain. I don't think I've ever seen one, but we do have these moths. Anyone know what kind of moth it is? Beatrice. Oh, it's not an elephant moth. Not an elephant moth. Anyone want to have another have another go? Go on, Robin. Is it some kind of hawk moth? Oh, it, 
well, I, this is where you're testing me. I actually don't know my classifications of moths that well. It might be. It's called, let me tell you what it's called. It, it might well be, Robin, I'm going to have to go and check later. It's actually called an emperor moth. It's called an emperor moth. Now, this is the male, the male emperor moth. The female emperor moth, it actually isn't as colourful, although can is actually bigger than the, 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 the male emperor moth. Do you know how big? Let me, well, actually, I, I'll show you how big they can get in a minute. There's the emperor moth. What, before the emperor moth was a moth, do, do you know what it was? Before the emperor moth is a moth, it has another life. Do you know, go on, Beatrice. A cocoon. Before a cocoon. Go on, Beatrice. A caterpillar, and here's a picture of the emperor moth caterpillar. Can you see? Now it's a big, it's a bit of a beast when it comes to caterpillars. Now I know in relation to us, it's not that big, but here's here's this gives you an idea of how big it is, because someone has taken a photograph of an emperor moth up against a ruler. Now can you see? Let me just show my my girls here in my in my lounge and anyone else online. Can you see? That's inches across the top there. It's bigger than two inches. And here's centimetres at the bottom. It's about six centimetres. About six centimetres. That, that's, I know that won't help you on screen. That's a pretty, as caterpillars go, that's a, that's a bit of a beast. And actually, there are several varieties of them. And here's one. This looks pretty scary. This looks like something out of a, a dinosaur movie, doesn't it? This is a particular kind, and you can see the size relative. Someone's actually got it in their hands. Why they would have it in their hands? Well, they're braver than I am. Look at that. That's a particular, I forget the name. That's a particular kind of emperor moth. There's various varieties you can get. Can you see? What a beast. What a beast of a, of a, of a creature. Now then, how, and Beatrice helped us out here, how does the caterpillar of the emperor moth become that. They look very different to me. How does it go from that to that? Go on, Robin, can you tell us? Exactly. Very good summary indeed. And in fact, I've got a picture here of the Emperor Moth. I, do you know, interestingly, I found it really difficult to find a decent picture of this, of, of an Emperor Moth actually emerging out, out of its cocoon. Okay, actually emerging. Now, I don't know if you can see this. I'm just going to show this to my girls first. Can you see? There's the cocoon. And here's the emperor moth squeezing its way out. Okay, it's almost unrecognizable. Here's the cocoon there. And this is actually the emperor moth squeezing its way, way out. Now, I've never seen an emperor moth do it. But I have seen, if you go to Blenheim Palace, there's a, a very large um, kind of conservatory area. And they've got this butterfly display. And if you go into the entrance... They often have butterflies with their cocoons. Actually, I would, and you can watch the butterflies coming out. And you know, and this is true, even more true of the emperor moth. It, it is an excruciating experience because they've got this cocoon and there's this tiny hole that they squeeze their way out of. And, and it depends on the variety, the species, on the butterfly or the moth. It can take anything from half an hour to several hours to get out. And as you're watching the emperor moth, apparently, I've not seen it in person, but I've read accounts. As you're watching the emperor moth try to squeeze its way out of the cocoon, it's an excruciating experience. As it squeezes through this tiny hole, and, and you just think, what is going on here? It's never going to get out and inch by inch. Well, not literally, but millimeter by millimeter, it manages to get its way out. It's a painful, difficult experience for the moth to transform from a caterpillar to a cocoon to a proper moth. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, actually, did you know, in that, that's an amazing picture of a pattern that God gives us, a pattern that we see in creation, like in butterflies and moths, but a pattern we also see in the Bible, and particularly in salvation that we have to go through sometimes for transformation to happen. We have to go through an excruciating experience to come out transformed, renewed, new in our God. And of course, what's the best picture of this? 
This is it here. This is the best picture of it here. Can you see? What have we got here? We've got, what have we got, Arabella? The tomb and the tea. We've got the cross and the tomb empty. Jesus came out of the tomb a new man, didn't he? He came out a resurrected man. He came out having died never to die again, to live for ever. But he had to die on the cross first. He had to lay down his life on the cross, be buried for three days, and then be risen to new life. And, and, and this is actually a pattern that we're going to be picking up on in our reading in just a little bit. That Jesus is teaching his disciples, just as he has to die and be risen again, just as the emperor moth has to, in a sense, die and, and go through this excruciating experience before it can come out a transformed emperor moth, so we as his people must expect a similar pattern in our lives. Sorrow first, lament first, difficulty and trial, and through those difficulties and trials, we come out new and joyful and blessed in our God. Do you know people have done experiments with the emperor moth and they've taken, just as the moth is coming out of the cocoon, they've taken a fine pair of scissors and they've, they've snipped the cocoon to, to make the gap wider, to make it easier for the emperor moth to come out. Now, do you know what happens? It does, it makes it easier. Instead of taking a few hours, the moth comes out in a few minutes. But do you know what? The moth is deformed. The wings are not big enough. Its body is all wrong and it doesn't survive for more than a few hours. You know why? The process of getting squeezed through that hole, do you know what it does? The process, as excruciating as it is, it actually squeezes fluid from its body into its wings so the wings can grow and develop and be, be, be the size they need to be and the strength they need to be to be able to fly. So it is actually through the process of that excruciating transformation that the, 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 the newness and the wholeness and the glory of the emperor moth is brought about. And you know, that's exactly what Jesus is teaching us in our passage. And in through the death and resurrection, it's through the sorrow. See, we can't, we can't avoid the sorrow. We can't avoid the death. Jesus couldn't. He had to die so that he could overcome death. And we have to be conformed to this pattern so that we through that pattern as excruciating as it sometimes is will be made like the Lord Jesus Christ this is really important children this is really important for all of us that we see this pattern you know some Christians get this wrong some Christians they don't want the sorrow they don't want the death they don't want the the little hole done and to be squeezed through they want to go let's get glory right now only Jesus knows better. Jesus says, no, now is a time. Yes, for joy, but also for sorrow and lament. But when he comes again, we will know true and full and lasting joy. Children, I know that's quite a long children's talk and quite complicated, but just remember this. Sorrow first, then joy. Humiliation, then exaltation. That's the pattern of things. And may God give us a humble spirit so we would be willingly conformed, like Jesus was, to that very pattern. Thanks for all your answers and for all your contributions. We'll learn more about that in our sermon in just a moment. We're going to continue to worship God as we confess our faith together. And we're going to use these words from the Nicene Creed, perhaps slightly longer than we than a confession of faith that we usually use, but it's worth the, the, the every word of this Trinitarian creed put together at the Council of Nicaea in 381. This is an ancient creed. This is a creed that sums up the wonderful theology and truth of the Bible about God and about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit and about what is ours in our God. Let's confess our faith together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father, 
before all ages. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of the same substance as the Father, by whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, he became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Well, we're going to turn to God's Word now, and we are in John chapter 16. John chapter 16, and we're going to read from verses 16 to 33. The reading will come up on your screens, but if you've got your Bibles at home, it might be helpful to grab them and have them open as well. We've been working our way through John's Gospel, largely for the whole of lockdown, not entirely the whole of lockdown, but pretty early on. We've been going at it at a fairly reasonable pace and we are at this last section in John chapter 16. This is John 13 to 16 or 17. There's some debate over where it should end. is is often referred to as the upper room discourse where Jesus, just hours before his death, has gathered his disciples and is teaching them and, and is instructing them and is preparing them. And so, in many ways, these are, are very special words recorded for us, because especially the words we're about to read, these are some of the last words Jesus Christ says to his disciples. The, the last instruction, the last preparation he gives them for what is to come. We've seen in chapter 15 that the world, Jesus said, though we should love one another, the world will hate us. But he said, you, you won't be left like orphans. When I go, I will send the helper, the Holy Spirit. And we've seen, haven't we, what the Holy Spirit will do in the world. He will, be, he will convict the world of its sin. And what he will do in the church, leading the church into all truth and glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we pick up the reading in John 16, verse 16. Before we read, let's pray again. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word we thank you for this remarkable insight and record we have of these final words in this upper room discourse of Jesus with his disciples those whom he loved we see the pastor at work we see the shepherd not concerned so much for himself even though he was facing imminently uh, a horrific death on the cross his concern was for his disciples and by extension for us his people throughout history. Lord, so help us to take heart, even as Jesus encourages us to take heart in these words. Help us to learn. Bless us by your spirit, even as we read them now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. John chapter 16, verse 16. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while... And you will see. So some of his disciples said to one another, well, What is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you'll see me. And because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, 
but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me. Now believe that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. For I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. Take heart, for I have overcome the world. Why is the Bible relentlessly honest about its heroes? Why are they, in the pages of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, to a man, to a woman, and to a child, portrayed as sinners? warts and all there is a relentless honesty to the bible the the the, the heroes of scripture and the heroines of scripture are portrayed as men and women who fall who mess up who experience huge adversity massive pain and frequent disappointments adam and eve they couldn't have messed things up more if they tried could they noah is hardly a moral pinup is he if you read his life. Abraham threatens the safety of his wife twice, and in doing so actually threatens the promised seed and of God. Isaac's preference of Esau is somewhat sickening. Jacob lives up to his name. He's so deceptive that in the end he deceives himself. Joseph is proud and haughty, and whilst in no world does he deserve to be thrown into a pit and sold to slavery, you can't help read the story and think, well, you had your comeuppance, you're so proud and haughty. David, well, dare we mention King David? An adulterer and a murderer. I could go on. What about the New Testament? What about... What about the apostles, the disciples, the early church? Well, they don't fare much better, do they? The disciples are uneducated fishermen. They're impetuous. They're hard-hearted. They're incredibly slow to learn. The early church is ridden with problems. Just read some of the the documents that Paul, uh, the letters that Paul writes. I mean, 1 Corinthians, the poor man must have been tearing what little hair he had left out, thinking, what is going on in the churches? And where is John himself, the writer of this epistle, at the end of his life? Has he seen prosperity, riches, success? He's on a craggy rock called Patmos, alone and in exile. It's hardly a success story, is it? The Bible is relentlessly honest about its heroes and heroines. Why? Why? Wouldn't you have thought... The writers of scripture would have been tempted to what historians call a little bit of revisionism. A little bit of historic revisionism. Let's rewrite history. As Moses was was writing the Pentateuch, as the prophets were 
were recording or being recorded in their messages to a, a, a sinful, rebellious Israel, as the New Testament gospel writers are recording the, the disciples' interactions with Jesus, as, as Paul is writing to the New Testament church for, for the church's benefit, don't you think a little bit of historical revisionism would have been a good plan? Let's make Israel out to be the perfect nation-state. Obeying all of God's commands, never out of his favour. Wouldn't that compel the nations to be like Israel? What about the disciples? What about John as he writes the, the gospel accounts? The temptation to portray himself and, and, and those closest to Jesus as being better than they actually were. As always understanding, as always getting it right, as always having the correct answers when Jesus asked them, as always being full of courage and boldness. Wouldn't they be tempted to do that? It doesn't history tell us this is what our historians do? I remember learning in uh, A-level history, how actually I think I learned it in GCSE history as well, how Mussolini, the leader of, of Italy in World War II, he was quite a short man. But he didn't want the Italian people to know he was short and diminutive. So he would only allow pictures to be taken uh, that showed him off to be taller than he was. So, for example, a lot of the pictures we have are, are, in, are him on horseback or in a tank or in some other vehicle. Because taken from below, shooting upwards, it made him look bigger and, and, and taller than he actually what? See, historic revisionism, a little bit of propaganda. Let's make our heroes look bigger and better and more successful and more courageous than they actually were. Wouldn't that make the story of Scripture, the gospel, that much more compelling? But isn't it amazing how the writers of Scripture never fall into that trap? They're brutally honest. Warts and all. John, in even recounting his own flaws, his own failures, his own lack of success, his discourage, not, not courage. Why? Because the one thing that historic revisionism would never do is prepare God's people for difficulty and for trauma and for tribulation and for challenge and for hostility. You see, see how damaging it would be if here you are as a Christian or as someone interested in Christianity and you read the heroes of the Bible, never get anything wrong, never fail, always succeed. And then you compare them to your life, always failing, struggling to succeed, lacking in courage, lacking in boldness. It, it would put you off, wouldn't it? No, we don't need a bit of historical revisionism. The brutal, visceral honesty of the warts and all heroes and heroines in the Bible are a wonder to us, are a, are a great encouragement to us because as we read about the disciples, even in this passage, getting it wrong, confused and perplexed, we can be encouraged. Why? Because Jesus, because God is trying to prepare us with that honesty. Historic revisionism would rob us of the honesty that we need, that the Christian life is going to be hard. And we need to be prepared for it. The Christian life is going to be full of challenges and difficulties and disappointments. And we need to be ready for it. And that's exactly what's going on here in this passage. No historical visionism. We have John and we have Jesus facing up to reality. Not ignoring the elephant in the room but of difficulty and trial and, 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 of, and of failure but, but of facing up to it so that the church, the disciples and the church throughout the ages can be encouraged and prepared and readied for those trials and difficulty. That's what's happening in these words, in these last words of Jesus Christ to his disciples before he heads to the cross, before he's put on trial. And he dies a terrible death. He's preparing us. He's preparing his disciples. He's preparing the church throughout the world. And he wants us to take heart. It's going to be difficult. But we can take heart. You see, we take heart not in some historic revisionism, not some pretend success and courage. We take heart that even in difficulty, trial and tribulation, Christ has overcome the world. We need this, don't we? 
we need this as God's people. I'm very struck that there are many passages of the Bible that in the Western world just don't read the same for us who live in ease and luxury as they read to the Christian church who are experiencing persecution and isolation and difficulty. Some of these words, we read these words and we read chapter 15, the world's going to hate you. And it's so remote to us. And yet these words are words of preparation and of help when we do go through trial. And we should read them through the eyes of our brothers and sisters throughout this world being persecuted and being locked up, being harassed, fearing for their lives. We should read them through that experience. Because what we have then is these words would be life to us. These words would be encouragement to us. We would take heart that Jesus has overcome the world. We need these words. We need to be prepared for the realities of Christian of the Christian life. As we look at these words, notice three things with me. First of all, notice this. Know your place in God's plan. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what he's teaching the disciples. This is what John, the gospel writer, is trying to communicate to us, his readers. Know your place in God's plan. Now, why do I say that? Well, we've got to step back and just notice something I've already alluded to, and that is the sheer perplexity of the disciples in these verses. Did you notice it? Twice we get the disciples interacting with Jesus, speaking. Verses 17 to 18 and verses 29 to 30. Verses 17 to 18. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while and you'll not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. They're perplexed. They're confused. Jesus has said, I'm going to go. And in a little while, I'm going to come again. And rather, rather than fixing on his going or his coming, they fix on the little while. How long is it going to be? What does it mean? And they just don't understand. And then in verses 29 to 30, suddenly they, Jesus is no longer, according to them, speaking in figurative language. He's speaking plainly. And suddenly they come out with this confident profession. Ah, oh, now, verse 29, you're speaking plainly and now using, not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And how does Jesus respond? Do you now believe? Don't you know you're going to be scattered? Don't be so rash. Don't be so confident in your commitment to me. What, what are we getting here? What are we seeing here? The disciples are, are bewildered. They're confused. They're perplexed. They just don't understand Jesus and what's going on. They cannot comprehend what he's saying to them. On the one hand, they're confused. On the other, they're rashly confident. In just a few hours, not only will Jesus go to the cross, they will desert him at the cross. And what will have happened to their confidence then? What are we seeing here? I think it's worth stepping back and drawing out a few lessons. First of all, did you know it's okay to be confused sometimes? It's okay to be confused sometimes. Just think about the first readers of this gospel. Here's John. John does not hide. There's no historic revisionism here. John is one of the esteemed apostles, the foundation of the church with the Lord Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. And here John is writing this, and, and this is not what, what you would call hagiography. You know what hagiography is? Hagiography is, is where you write the life of someone and you leave out all the bad bits. Sadly, an awful lot of Christian biographies like this. It's not biography, it's hagiography. That we make... I remember reading um, a, a, a biography of... Um, well, I'm actually... Not, well, it doesn't matter. It was, it was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, this brief, great man of God. But I read the biography, put it down and thought, I, I feel like I should worship him. He, he did nothing wrong. He, he never said anything wrong. He, he just was, he's like the saviour figure. I then remember reading another biography of Charles Haddon Spurgeon that was much, it wasn't hagiography, it was biography. He struggled. He went through times of depression and discouragement. He got things wrong. See, see what hagiography does? It makes the person, the biography, it makes them out to be Jesus-like, actually. And it doesn't help anyone. 
See, John isn't interested in, in hagiography. He's not rewriting his own history. Warts and all, it is an honest portrayal of the disciples' confusion. Can you imagine this circulating? Imagine the gospel circulating around about, well, John is, let's say he's writing in, in, in the late first century. Can you imagine 100 AD, 120 AD, perhaps, perhaps earlier than that, John is alive and they're reading his gospel. And you can imagine John almost feeling a little embarrassed. What a buffoon I come across as. Complete confusion, bewilderment and perplexity. Here's Jesus. And here are the disciples. They're never going to meet this Jesus. Here's you, you, John, you were years with him and you still didn't get it right. John is unafraid and unashamed to record his own confusion. Why? I think there's something deeply pastoral here. Because it's native to the Christian life, that's why. We don't have all the answers all the time. Even the closest apostles were confused, bewildered and perplexed. Are you sometimes confused, bewildered and perplexed? I am. People come to me. You're a minister of the gospel, Andy. You've gone to theological college. You've been preaching for years and years. You must have all the answers. You know, sometimes I sit there and I haven't got a clue what to say. You're looking at me? <laughs> No, sure, I'll go away and I'll ask other, other, I'll ask men in the church and, and I'll pray about it and I'll read good books, but I still sometimes I'm confused. That's the Christian life sometimes. And you know, it's okay. It's okay sometimes, particularly in the face of hardship and struggle and trial to go, do you know what? This is tough and I don't know what's going on. This is the portrayal of the disciples here. I think there's a second lesson from this. And now we're getting into really what the main purpose of this heading. Know your place in God's plan. Because the, what brings clarity to the disciples? What brings clarity is a few days later. What happens a few days later? Well, a few hours later, Jesus dies. That doesn't necessarily bring clarity. Then he's buried. But on the third day, he's risen again. You see, the disciples are at a particular point in the plan of God. Little did they know that they are on the brink, literally hours and days from the brink of one of the most important events in the whole of human history, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they are confused partly because they don't understand what's about to happen and they don't understand their place, literally their location in the unfolding plan of God. What are we going to, we, what are we going to see as we read Acts 1 and 2? We see the same disciples, the same apostles empowered to preach the gospel with full clarity, with full 2020 biblical vision over the importance of Christ and of what has happened. What's changed? What's changed is the death and resurrection. That's why. And Jesus is teaching us here. Know your place in God's plan. You could read these words in, in two or three ways, actually. And I wonder, I've spent all week wrestling with this and it doesn't help when you go and read commentators, and although there's a time and place for that, because they all have a different opinion, and they all seem to say different things, etc., etc. But how do you read these words? Jesus, verse 16, a little while and you'll see me no longer, and again a little while and you'll see me. So Jesus is going to go and he's going to come back. Well, when's he going to come back? Well, there is an argument, quite a cogent argument, that this is talking about his resurrection. That literally in three days, three or four days time, I will come back to you. You will see me. There's also an argument that this is talking about Pentecost. That, that, that when, when Jesus will come back to be with his people is in the personal work of the Holy Spirit. There's also an argument that he's talking about his second coming, his return. So which one is it? Well, I think, I think it's purposefully ambiguous. I might be wrong on this. I'm willing to be corrected. But I, I think there's a purposeful, and there's a multi-layered meaning to this. That for the disciples, they're going to see Jesus again after his death and resurrection and clarity will be brought. For the early church, Pentecost will happen and Christ will speak and lead through the Spirit and clarity will be brought. For us, 2,000 years later, one day Jesus is going to return. A bodily resurrection will happen. And full, consummated clarity will be brought. You see, what 
is happening here. We need to know our place in God's plan. We need to step back. Jesus is, is teaching them a plan, isn't he? He's teaching them a purpose. He's, he's saying that, that I know what's going on. I know the order of events. And I'm coming back. Whether it's immediately after the resurrection, whether it's Pentecost or whether it's his return, I am going to be coming back to you. And you need to know your place in that plan. Did you know as well, before I move to my second point, knowing our place in that plan is vitally important, specifically to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whether we understand this or apply it in terms of his, his immediate return in his resurrection, Pentecost or his second coming, the death and resurrection is, is, is the centre around which everything turns. I would suggest to you, this isn't going to answer all your questions, but a lot of questions in the Christian life are understood post-death and resurrection or in light of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ Jesus is teaching them a theology here just wait disciples you're confused and perplexed now but once the death and resurrection happens it, it clarifies everything it's the interpretative tool of scripture it's a, the thing around which everything revolves the fulcrum the hinge and often our questions our struggles are resolved at least in part when we know our place in God's plan. In other words, when we know the death and resurrection has happened. We live post that. What a wonderful joy this should be for us. That we look back at a saviour who's died and risen. Secondly, would you notice, we don't, we don't just need to know our place in God's plan. Jesus is teaching them to expect sorrow according to God's pattern. Know our place according to God's plan, but expect sorrow according to God's pattern. How does Jesus answer the disciples' question about this phrase, in a little while? Well, he tells them they will have sorrow. And he repeats this multiple times. Let me just highlight this for you. Verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. But the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will return to joy. Verse 21, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish. Verse 22, so also you have sorrow now. Verse 31, he actually carries this on. You will be scattered, he says. Verse 33, in the world, you will have tribulation. Jesus even uses an illustration for this sorrow, doesn't he? He uses the illustration of childbirth. He uses the illustration of, of, of the labour pains of giving birth, the pain, the trauma, the difficulty. The, 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 the excruciating nature of that experience. The sorrow that it can bring in the moment. And of course Jesus doesn't just pluck that illustration out of the blue for, for no particular reason. It's actually an Old Testament illustration that's repeated Throughout the Old Testament, Old Testament the, the, particularly Isaiah actually in several places, Isaiah 26 particularly, but also Isaiah 13 and a few other places, uses the picture of the difficulties and the trials and the exile of God's people. He, he, he likens it to a woman giving birth and the pain and the suffering that God's people will experience now again it's worth asking the question what's jesus talking about here specifically what's he referring to what is this sorrow going to be well again i think there's multiple levels in which we can apply this i think there's an immediate fulfillment to this isn't there within hours he's going to die within hours his disciples will weep and lament they will be sorrowful they will be filled with sorrow Within hours, their saviour will be hanging on a cross and buried in a tomb. And in contrast, the world will rejoice. Jesus is dead. So for the disciples, there's an immediate experience of this, of this pattern of sorrow. But I think there's a wider fulfilment, isn't there? The age of the church, the age of Pentecost, that age in between the first coming and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, what will it be marked by? Well, Jesus has already been preparing us in John 15. The world will hate you. It'll be marked by trouble, trial and tribulation. 
verse that always jumps out at me in Acts. It's Acts chapter 14, verse 22. And Paul and Barnabas are on the second cycle of, I think it's their second missionary journey. And they're going around the churches again that they've originally planted. And they're appointing elders and, and seeking to grow the church. And we're just given this little insight into their teaching in one particular place. In Acts chapter 14, uh, Paul's at Lystra. And we read in Acts 14 verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra uh, and to Iconium and to Antioch. And verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, and I listen to this, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. No historic revisionism. An honest pastoral advice and encouragement to the churches as Paul and Barnabas what are they saying be prepared for the tribulations exactly what Jesus is saying here in the age of the church it'll be marked by trial and tribulation the church is called to sorrow it's called to take up its cross it's called to die it's called to walk in the footsteps of Christ and there's a pattern going on here isn't there we saw this last week that the hostility of the world to the church follows a pattern, the pattern of Christ himself. They hated Christ, they'll hate his disciples. Christ has to die on the cross. We will sorrow even as unto death. Jesus is saying expect sorrow according to this pattern. Before I move on, it's worth noting a few things about this sorrow. I'm going to get to this under my third point, but I will note it just right here. The sorrow will turn to joy. It doesn't end in sorrow, does it? There is a pattern. Sorrow, then joy. Trial, tribulation and difficulty, then triumph. There is a pattern here. But the one must come before the other. And that's the second thing to note. This sorrow does turn into joy, but there's a pattern. There's a structure to it. There's a pattern to God's working. Sorrow, then joy. Humility, then exaltation. Death, then resurrection. Defeat, then victory. And it's worth noting, it's what Jesus is teaching. And you see the pastor here. This sorrow we'll experience is according to this pattern. It's not random. It's not out of control. It's not arbitrary. God, in his sovereignty, is conforming us to the very pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't he? But notice one other thing about this pattern. The sorrow and the joy are connected. They're connected. It's not just that one comes after the other. It's that the first guarantees the second. They're connected. The sorrow is necessary for the joy to happen. Or put it like this. Christ had to die so that he could be raised to, to, to new life. And in fact, it was in his death, it was in his death that he secures new life. It is in his death that he puts death to death. It's in his death on the cross that he makes open triumph of the devil and of this world. He had to die, and it was through his death that his new life comes about. This pattern should actually encourage us. When we lament and weep, when we struggle and experience trial and difficulty, we can know it is not futile. It is securing for us. It is guaranteeing for us that future joy. The groans that guarantee glory. Doesn't Christ's own illustration point this out? Doesn't Christ's own illustration bear this out? Forgive the pun. Birth. A woman in childbirth. What does the pain of her childbirth guarantee to her? That the pregnancy is almost over. That the pain is almost done. That joy is, it comes in the morning as the psalmist says. That, 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 that it's just round the corner. That the baby is coming and of course the two are connected. The one secures the other. You can't have a new life in your arms uh, uh, until, you, until she, that, that baby has been born and gone through the, the, the pains of childbirth. God has a pattern. He has a plan and he has a pattern. And we need to know our place in the plan, the death and resurrection. We need to know the working of God's pattern in redemption. Sorrow, then joy. 
sorrow, joy through sorrow, death and resurrection, resurrection through death. Take up your cross and follow me. Why? Because that will secure for you life, joy to its fullest, as we shall see. Before we move to my third point on joy, can I just make one final comment here? You'll have to forgive me. I, I just, I'm, I'm a complete, when I hear something and I learn something, I just, I'm going to regurgitate it. And I was in a conference this week in, in London. It was very, very helpful. And a man called Dan Strange was helping us think through mission and points of contact with our world. And it was incredibly helpful. And he identified what, what, uh, a, a missiologist, a guy called J.H. Bavink, nephew of the great Herman Bavink, I, I, I pointed out what he called five magnetic points, points at which every worldview, every, every way of thinking, every religion has these five things that dominate them, that, that kind of bring them, they can't help get drawn to these things. And what's one of them? One of them is totality. Every world view and every world religion wants a system that explains the system, that explains the whole. And we get drawn to this. We want a meta-narrative. We want something, something bigger than us that we're part of. It's amazing as you read scripture. This is exactly what God gives us. God's working is according to a plan and a pattern, a totality. Jesus comes. He dies on the cross, he rises again, he goes into heaven, and he's returning. So that's what verse 16 is. Verse 16 is actually God's plan. A little while and you'll see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. There's history encapsulated on multiple levels. I, I'm going to go, and I'm going to come back again. That's it. A total plan around which we can fit our lives, know our place in God's plan, expect sorrow according to God's pattern. Finally, and briefly, anticipate joy in God's peace. What will of necessity follow on from sorrow for the Christian? I've already said it. It's going to be joy. And as much as Jesus talks about sorrow in these verses, he talks about joy as well, yes, according to a God's plan and according to his pattern, but nonetheless, it's going to come. Verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, you'll weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. The illustration he uses of childbirth bears this out. But when she's delivered the baby, verse 21, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Verse 22, Jesus keeps on so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Verse 24, your joy will be full. To so note this pattern, we've, we've thought about the sorrow, but the sorrow guarantees the joy. That's what Jesus is saying here. There is a pattern, there is a plan, but you can be at peace because their joy is coming. Rejoicing will be yours and again think about those three levels at which you can apply this this was true of the disciples the joy when they, they meet Jesus the risen Jesus again the excitement the relief the clarity and what about Pentecost the joy at Pentecost at being emboldened by the power of the Spirit sent because of the risen ascended ruling Lord Jesus Christ the joy that they offer our world to bow before the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. A joy that we can experience now in being God's people. But also what about that third horizon? That third horizon of fulfilment. The joy when Jesus Christ comes again. When all weeping and lamenting and sorrow will be ended. See this, this is the when. This is the in a little while. As the disciples con are confused by what Jesus is saying. This is what we have, and Jesus is assuring us we've got joy. But notice something else about this joy. In what, or better, in whom is this joy? Is it just this ecstatic, out-of-body experience that we'll, we'll have? No, 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 no. The joy that Jesus Christ is offering is, is located in him. He is the joy. Did you notice that in verse 22? So also you have sorrow now. But I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy 
from you. You can see how it's located in Christ. I will see you again. The joy is located in the person of Christ himself. And I think all these, these verses actually revolve around not just the person of Christ, but also the work of Christ. He's going to go, but he's going to come again. That is encapsulating his death, resurrection, ascension, reign and return. Within that, we will have joy in the work of Christ. And it's striking, isn't it, in verse 33. What does he say? I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Take heart, for I have overcome the world. What is to be the centre of our joy? What is to be the cause of our joy? It's Jesus Christ himself. That's what it is. The joy for the Christian is not, it's not some ecstatic experience, this kind of seventh heaven, this kind of walking on cloud nine with this inane grin because of some spiritual gift that we've got. No, 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 no. The joy is found in Christ, in who he is and what he's done for us. That's what Jesus is saying. Center your joy. Your joy will be full because my work will be complete. I have overcome the world. Let me ask you and let me challenge you and let me encourage you. Where did, where's your joy located? Is your joy located in something you can lose? Is it located in something temporary? Is it located in something passing? Or is it located in Christ? Is it located in him? What gives, you, what gives you real joy? Christ, Christ's person, his loveliness, his humility, his service, his love for us, his reign, his death and resurrection, his return. That should give us real joy. That, that's where joy is located. J.C. Ryle, the great bishop, Anglican bishop in his commentaries on the Gospels, he, he says this. That the Christian life should be marked by looking back to the cross, looking up to the right hand of God, and looking forward to the return of Christ. That's great, isn't it? We look back, we look up, we look forward. Look back to what Christ has done on the cross. Look up to his present rule and reign and his intercession as our high priest. And we look forward because one day he will return. Jesus is saying, take heart. Yes, you're going to... You need to know your place in my plan. Yes, you're going to be conformed to the pattern of my working. But in me, you have peace and you have joy that this world cannot take away from you. The Bible is honest about its characters, about its heroes and heroines. It never hides their flaws and sins. And that should be a source of great encouragement to us. Because actually it is through the adversity, it is through the trial, it is through their, their flaws and their failures that what do we see on the pages of scripture? That these same flawed, failing heroes and heroines, what do they do? Yes, they're flawed. Yes, they're failing. Yet they have success through their flaws and their failures. It is through the difficulties, it is through the deaths, it is through the failures that God brings about triumph and resurrection and new life and new power. I often think of, especially this time of year, of Wimbledon and the great tennis competition. Of course, Andy Murray's had two or three years of injury and difficulty, but in his glory days, it seemed like the whole of our country wanted Andy Murray to win at Wimbledon, and, and he has done, hasn't he? But when he would come up against maybe in the quarterfinals or the semifinals or even in the finals, he'd come again up against Federer or Djokovic or Nadal. What would, there's a part of you that would want to go, oh, I wish it could just be some easier competition. You, you, you'd want to watch those games and just be able to cheer on your, your champion thinking he's going to win easily. You, you'd love him to, to succeed, you know, win every match and w win every point and never have his serve broken and win three sets to nil and it'll all be over in an hour and a half. There's a party. Wouldn't that be great? But how much sweeter was it? I think it was against Djokovic, the then world number one. I think it went to five sets. I can't remember. It may have been four, but don't, don't quote me. It doesn't matter. 
It was a tough, hard-fought victory, and Murray showed both his strengths and his weaknesses, and there were moments where we thought Djokovic was going to win and Murray was going to lose, but he won, didn't he? Through the trial, through the tribulation, the harder the adversity, the sweeter the victory. How much sweeter? He overcame all odds. He's the true champion. He beat the best in the world. It's the same with Christ, isn't it? That's a silly illustration, I know. But we can take heart. We don't need historic revisionism. We don't need heroes and heroines who get nothing wrong, have no warts, don't have feet of clay. They faced hostility. We will face hostility. They faced tribulation. We will face tribulation. They faced sorrow, lament and weeping. We will face sorrow, lament and weeping. But what happened? Their sorrow turned to joy. Their death turned to resurrection. And why? All because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died and rose. So we will die and rise again. There's one final point as I conclude I wanted to draw out that I haven't had time to, to go into. But let me just give this to you as a parting, closing thought. What then should we do? We, we need to know our place according in God's plan. We need to expect sorrow according to God's pattern. And we need to... Uh, anticipate joy in God's peace. What well, did you know? We can express faith through prayer. Uh, isn't it remarkable? And again, I don't have time. What does Jesus talk about twice in these verses? Prayer. That's what he says. You, you won't have to ask me personally. Why? Because he tells us in verse 27, for the Father himself loves you. What are we to do as we're being conformed to this pattern? What, how are we to express ourselves as a church and as God's people? How are we to live then in the face of all these, these difficulties? Jesus is saying in verse 24, Ask and you will receive that your joy will be made full. Enjoy this blood-bought relationship I have for you. Commune with your Father. He loves you. You're his. Talk to him in prayer. Call out upon him. Share your woes, your difficulties, your sorrows. And you know what's amazing? Next week, God willing, we'll get there. This is exactly what Jesus does in chapter 17. What does he do? He models for us what we're to do in the midst of this, this Christ-conforming pattern and plan of sorrow, then joy. You pray. You trust. You'll throw yourselves upon God. That's what he does in chapter 17. And that's what we can and we must do as his people because our Father loves us. So take heart. Christ has overcome the world. Let's pray together. Lord our God, there's so much in this passage we're so conscious we haven't dealt with or touched upon. And yet we see here a wonderful pastor shepherd seeking to prepare and ready his sheep for all that's to come. Lord, give us mature eyes of faith to prepare ourselves for the realities and challenges and difficulties of this Christian life. Help us to willingly submit ourselves to this, to this pattern that you are conforming your people to. Sorrow, then joy, death, then resurrection. Defeat, then victory. Help us to submit to that and trust in you through it. May we, through our sorrows, know joy. Through our taking up our cross, know resurrection power. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to end by singing our final hymn by Stuart Townend and Keith and Christian Getty. This wonderful, thoughtful, thought-provoking hymn, Still My Soul Be Still and Do Not Fear. So
for some fellowship in breakout rooms just hang on in there and uh, we'll move you into some breakout rooms in just a moment but receive now the parting blessing from the triune God may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all